Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Warning this episode of Turning Tides contains adult themes, depictions of war, slavery, violence, murder, and suicide. Singapore is a small chain of islands located at the very tip of the Malay Peninsula. The islands are surrounded by the Straits of Johor, Singapore, and Malacca. The geopolitically significant South China Sea lies just to the east. These geographical features gave way to Singapore becoming an epicenter for the major trading hubs of India, China, and Southeast Asia. Singapore attracted people of all walks of life from all over Eurasia. The heartbeat of the people was the sea. The ocean and its currents dictated everyday life, and the seasonal monsoons pushed traffic north or south. Arab traders arrived from the east bringing the Quran with them, while Chinese junks, or trading vessels, plied their porcelain in Southeast Asian markets. We know shockingly little about the first settlements on Singapore's main island. British colonizers leveled all of the original architecture, with excavations beginning in the 1980s. Regardless, what we do know is that the people were of the waves. They referred to themselves as the Orang Laut, translating to Sea People. It is possible that this group came from one of the many islands of modern-day Indonesia. They inhabited the Riau Linga archipelagos before founding the first settlement on modern-day Singapore Island. They were traders and warriors. Their boat, the Prahu, or Prau, was perfectly designed for navigating the thousands of separate islands which they called home. They harvested food from the sea and from the many mangrove swamps in the area. Since Southeast Asia did not have the Great Plains necessary for supporting a large population, it is likely these Orangalaut settlements had few inhabitants. Regardless, they built a refined culture that left traces in Singapore up until the mid-20th century, before finally being driven out by increasing modernization. Favorite practice of newly wed Orangalaut couples was to float away on a raft, using the water's currents to take them to any island they fancied. If perchance the island on which they landed already had a couple inhabiting it, they would simply set off again, knowing they could be carried back to their families by the seasonal monsoon winds. Monsoons, officially designated as large scale sea breezes, first developed over 20 million years ago. This meteorological event occurred following the uplifting of the Tibetan Plateau. The cool air collided with the warm air from India, and after a period of gestation over the Indian Ocean, they created clouds which bore great storms. These storms have caused flooding and devastation but they also bring greenery and life to southern Asia during the dry seasons. Singapore was perfectly positioned to benefit from these storms, while experiencing few of the downsides of the phenomena. The Oranglaut were accustomed to these conditions and knew when to expect these storms based on time of year and the violence of the seas. Apart from being expert navigators, they were master swimmers who were constantly in the water. Early Europeans were astonished by their dexterity in the water and claimed the Orangalaut could hold their breath for over 30 minutes. They suffered from itchiness and dry skin, 
A life in and out of salt water will do that. Aside from this, they enjoyed excellent health, as they ate many tropical fruits and protein-rich seafood. The Orang Laut would also discover a way to fight tooth decay with the betel leaf, a plant native to the area. Thanks to their lack of centralization, the Orang Laut never had a unified power base nor a kingdom to call their own. Due to this, many historians have discounted the Orang Laut. Failing to appreciate these peoples and their contributions to Singapore, as well as Southeast Asia at large. They were often vilified as pirates, but to the Orang Laut, piracy was a natural part of life, a way to profit and tax the waterways on which they lived. Unfortunately, their maritime nature has left little physical evidence of their day-to-day -day lives. But there is no doubt that these semi-nomadic groups of fishermen were the catalyst for the founding of Singapore's first permanent settlement. By the 13th century, Singapore Island had been settled. The first of these settlements was located on the northern end of the Singapore River Basin. Geopolitically, this settlement was very strategic. China had always been the main force in the region. Its power, opulence, and wealth could not be matched by any of the smaller kingdoms of Indonesia, Myanmar, or Thailand. As China began to allow its merchants a freer hand in conducting trade, South India, under the Chola kings, moved across the Bay of Bengal, turning Southeast Asia into a battleground for trade and ideas. Additionally, the kingdom of Srivijaya, which had dominated this crucial crossroads, collapsed and became lost to history for hundreds of years. The Majapahit Empire replaced the 600-year-old polity and are accredited with the founding of Singapore, which was then called Tamasek, or the Lion City. When Tamasek was founded, it was done so with the religious and cultural preferences of the local Malay people in mind. In the legend of the founding of Singapore, Prince Sri Trai Buana was attacked by a baby deer while out on a hunt in the area. He is said to have proclaimed that this would be the place in which he'd found his city, as even the baby deer knew how to fight. The prince's domain was located on a hill. This was a symbolic representation of Mount Meru, a famous peak in Buddhist and Hindu cosmology. Throughout Southeast Asia, there are stunning examples of this, the most famous being Angkor Wat, a man-made pyramid in present-day Malaysia. One of the few sources we have to give us insight into Singapore's early founding is the pseudo-historical text, the Malay Chronicle. In the Chronicles, detailed earlier, the founder of Singapore is the mythical Sri Trai Buana, whose name translates to Lord of the Three Worlds. It seems even the Chronicle recognizes Singapore's vital position as a place composed of three very different worlds. The few archaeological finds show that the island had a very diverse society for its time. Modern-day Fort Caning was the home of royalty, while the people who inhabited the plain invariably produced pots and vases, which would go on to hold the elite's wine and alcohol. Already Chinese porcelain was being traded here, causing Singapore to grow as an entrepot, as well as become the target of hostile attacks. This is exemplified in the fact that the Singapore stone, a massive stone telling of the origin of the island, is written in a form of old Javanese. The island of Java is hundreds of miles away from Singapore. Alongside these new Javanese residents, there were also many inhabitants from South China. Additionally, the Orang Laut now composed the honor guard for the leaders of Malacca. They acted at his behest and were granted honors and privileges for their services as pirates and mercenaries. According to Chinese texts, some of the earliest exports which left Singapore were, quote, hornbill casks, middle-quality lacquer wood, and cotton, unquote. These casks, 
were used as a replacement for ivory and proved to be a much more cost-efficient substitute. Additionally, camphor, a white powder found in essential oils, benzoin, a gum resin, and frankincense were exported to China from the early settlement. By the 15th century, the Majapahit Empire was supplanted by the kingdom of Ayutthaya, and Singapore's status as a trade hub began to decline. Following the conquests of the Mongols and the ensuing Little Ice Age, the world experienced a violent period of political upheaval, which led many people to migrate. In Singapore, the Islamic faith spread on the sails of Muslim traders from Arabia. In China, the Yuan dynasty was faltering. When the Ming dynasty came into power, they became deeply concerned with their relations with Southeast Asia and India. This culminated in the Grand Imperial Expedition under Admiral Zheng He. Sensing a promising opportunity on the horizon, the leader of the nearby port of Malacca swore fealty to the Ming dynasty. In turn, the port of Malacca was now the official port of call for all Chinese vessels. Singapore fell into disrepair, and it was now used as a feeder port for goods which were inbound to Malacca. Malacca was the home of a growing sultanate of the same name, who used their location to their utmost advantage. They were smack dab in the middle of a global race to acquire spices, on which they alone conveniently sat. One of their main crops was pepper. Pepper is native to a handful of small islands in Southeast Asia, though the taste for pepper has permeated nearly every culture. Expeditions would be launched, lands would be claimed, and people would be extinguished in the quest to make elite European dishes more palatable. During this time, Singapore was the base of the Orang Laut and the navy of Malacca. The Orang Laut would comprise about half of the Sultan's military forces. John Curtis Perry states that the Malacca Sultanate was composed of, quote, Chinese, Javanese, Tagalogs, Persians, Tamils from South India, Gujarati Indians from the far northwest of the subcontinent, and even a few of the great cosmopolitan traders, Armenians and Jews. Unquote. The first Europeans to arrive were the Portuguese. They were led by a war party under the command of Alfonso de Albuquerque. Fortunately for the Sultan of Malacca, he received ample warnings that the Portuguese were coming from his Orang Laut soldiers. He was able to flee inland with the population to the settlement of Sayong Pinang. Far from being a retreat, this moved the trade routes and connections slightly more upriver. The Portuguese's attempt at an early global empire floundered in the face of determined native resistance. Their factory at Malacca saw the once great port decline rapidly. Another regional power began exerting serious influence over the straits and the people who lived there. This was the nearby Sultanate of Ake, which controlled the Pepper Islands and the northern half of the island of Sumatra. Their control over these vital resource-rich lands made them incredibly rich and turned them into a military powerhouse. Eventually, they would end up controlling both sides of the straits, with their territory spanning the modern-day countries of Malaysia and Singapore, as well as parts of Indonesia. The climate and the hard-to-navigate waterways devastated many Europeans. Few survived even a few weeks in these tropical lands. Additionally, they were constantly apprehended by local forces who were intent on removing these invaders. Throughout the 16th century, the state of affairs maintained its push-and-pull nature, with native peoples fighting the Portuguese for economic control of the vital straits. The fight was skewed in favor of the technologically superior Europeans, but the armies of Johor utilized guerrilla ambush tactics to even the playing field. The Portuguese were constantly losing men to native warriors in fever. By the end of the 16th century, the native warriors turned out to be the least of the Portuguese invaders' concerns. Armed with a powerful merchant navy, 
the Dutch would find themselves challenging the Portuguese for control of Southeast Asia. With the arrival of the Dutch, the leader of Johor, which was formerly known as the Malacca Sultanate, Raja Bang Su, seek to capitalize on this new political player. He allied himself with the Dutch against the Portuguese, and for a time, Johor prospered thanks to his cold and calculating decisions. The Dutch went about quickly setting up their factories and colonial settlements. This was done under the VOC, or Dutch East India Company, to state from the book 700 years, quote, the VOC's charter endowed the firm with substantial quasi-state powers, including the right to sign international agreements and treaties, levy troops, wage war, mint coins, and adjudicate crime, unquote. The VOC was utilized as a mercenary army for the Dutch state. Their behavior in modern-day Indonesia was as terrifying as that of the Spanish in the Caribbean. They would arrive on an island, kill or deport everyone, then burn the specialized spices which grew there. This increased their economic monopoly on any spice they chose. The death toll is unclear, but those who experienced Dutch quote-unquote economics firsthand certainly found their whole way of life turned upside down or destroyed completely. Following World War II, over 300,000 Indonesians would be killed by Dutch troops after the country declared independence. In Roagade, over 400 people were butchered by the Dutch in a single instance. As the 17th century began, the first true global war was waged between Spain, the Dutch, the English, the Portuguese, and less so, the French and the Danish. It would go on continuously for nearly 200 years, the Dutch were the first to strike. In February 1603, the Dutch seized the Portuguese carrick, the Santa Catarina, as it entered Singaporean waters. It was laden with trade goods from across Japan and China. Its value was equal to half the VOC's entire net worth. Besides being a huge boon for the Dutch war effort, the capture of the Catalina had another worldwide consequence. Back in the Netherlands, Hugo Grotius anonymously penned three books on the law of war and peace. In doing so, Grotius laid the foundation for modern international law. The Portuguese, furious, responded by blockading the Johor River. The Dutch responded with their own fleet and swamped the Portuguese once more. Finally, in 1606, Malacca was besieged by land and sea by the combined Dutch and Johorian forces. Finally, in 1606, Malacca was besieged by land and sea by combined Dutch and Johorian forces. After Malacca's fall, Southeast Asia struggled to recover, and they had no system of power in place. Ake's leaders saw their opportunity in the fragile peace which reigned in the wake of the 1610 agreement between the Dutch and Johor alliance and the Portuguese. They launched a complete surprise attack, a hundred war galleons containing 20,000 to 40,000 soldiers at Raja Bangsu of Johor. It's very likely they first destroyed the Johorian armada at Singapore before capturing the capital and imprisoning the Raja. The Aceh Sultanate was now growing exponentially in Sumatra and Malaysia. It was during this time that the first plans for a settlement in Singapore were posed. Both the Dutch and Portuguese frequented the island, as it happened to have a fresh water source and a natural harbor. To offset their increasing imbalance in the fight, the Portuguese often used go-betweens to handle their trade. These invariably turned out to be Englishmen. The Dutch plans to found a settlement on Singapore were tabled in favor of developing their already growing colonies in Java and southern Sumatra. As these plans were put on hold, a Spanish armada arrived in Southeast Asia. Its leader mysteriously died, and the 5,000 or more sailors and soldiers who were on board were completely decimated by disease. 
which may have been intentionally spread by the local Orangelaut. Britain, of course, inserted itself into this complicated geopolitical situation. They founded several colonies in Southeast Asia, starting at the turn of the 17th century. These included several of the Spice Islands, as well as the islands of Pulo Ai and Pulo Rune. They would lose these small but valuable islands after the signing of the Treaty of Breda in 1667, which, among other things, gave Britain control of the island of Manhattan. Far from being the end of hostilities, the Dutch and the British would go to war four separate times following this, both vying for commercial and naval supremacy along the global sea routes. As the 17th century wound down, regicide would grip the Sultanate of Johor. Mahmud II was struck down by his own personal guard. This occurred following a row with a woman who had attempted to seduce him on his mother's orders. After he denied her advances multiple times and she kept trying, he eventually had the woman's arms broken. To recount what follows from British explorer Alexander Hamilton, quote, Next morning, he sent a royal guard to bring her father's head. But, as he was entering the door, the Orangkai, the royal guards, passed a long lance through his heart, unquote. The crisis of secession which followed ruined the chances of a sovereign and independent Johorian state. The prime minister was elevated to sultan, while pretenders claimed to be the illegitimate heirs of Mahmud II. 1719, the former prime minister's capital was stormed. He was executed and his son called for aid. In a desperate move, he invited thousands of Bugis people from the Sulawesi Islands in the Dutch East Indies to help him. In a story similar to the Saxon conquest in Britain, they became the backbone of the weak sultan. They were employed in many positions of power and held important posts in the government and military. The Bugis are vaunted warriors, both on land and sea. Their prowess in combat would place them at the top of the social hierarchy in Johor. One of the major losers in this influx of new, warlike people were the Orangelaut, who found themselves marginalized. Additionally, the Bugis moved the main port of Johor to Bintan in the Riau Island chain, removing the need for Singapore to remain a thriving settlement and naval yard. Johor's leaders were doing all they could to stay afloat in the ever-changing times. The British were looking for a base in the area with increasing ferocity. However, Dutch influence in the region was simply too strong. In 1703, in an attempt to pull the rug out from under the Dutch, the Sultan of Johor offered Singapore Island to the British. The British refused on economic grounds. They were much more interested in their North American and Indian colonies at present to worry about Southeast Asia just yet. Meanwhile, the Bugis people had gained complete control of Johor and the surrounding island chains. They exerted their influence in trade and commerce, stabilizing the troubled region. This was all at the expense of Singapore, as all Bugis trade flowed exclusively into and out of Bintan. Their main product was tin. They made a killing selling tin to Europeans, who in turn used it in canning food. This revolutionized the way human beings eat. You no longer had to worry about storing or salting your food to preserve it. It was already preserved with an airtight tin lid. The envious Dutch wanted their cut. And by their cut, I mean to say they wanted all of the profits from the trade. The Bugis and the Dutch fought for control of the Riau Islands. The war ended with the Bugis promising to sell their tin to Dutch traders at preferential rates. Singapore was a ghost town. There were a handful of families eking out an existence, attempting to grow rice for subsistence and camphor to sell to passing traders. They built their houses on stilts and had a local temingong, akin to a mayor who held together the small community. Some were Orangelaut, some Malays, and some were South Chinese. They lived a meager life, often with family and extended family living in the same house. 
A single person with no support system would not last long in these conditions. Family bound people together, kept people warm in the cold, and kept them supported in hard times. The Bugis would not be able to maintain their power in the region. The Dutch, following the death of the Bugis leader, heightened tensions with the seafaring people once more. The Fourth Anglo-Dutch War found these tensions spilling over into open war. The Bugis besieged Dutch Malacca, and in return, the Dutch blockaded the Riau Islands, crippling the Bugis economy. As the siege of Malacca dragged on, a Dutch fleet came to the rescue of the beleaguered colony and killed the Bugis leader in the ensuing fight. The war was finished in one fell swoop. Most of Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia were now under Dutch overlordship. The separate leaders of these regions were forced to accept the bitter pill of being crammed into a single polity, all for the sake of their new Dutch administrators. They sent out a distress call, and the Aranum answered. These were Moros from the Philippine islands of Mindanao. These piratical warriors stormed Bintan and ran off the Dutch garrison in 1787. The Dutch were in a terrible position at this point, completely beholden to French interests. Following their defeat at the hands of the British in 1784, the VOC, or Dutch East India Company, was flat broke and had to finally dissolve itself after a 200-year-long run. Additionally, the treaty ending the war stipulated freedom of navigation for all British vessels. This effectively broke the back of the Dutch monopoly on the spice trade. The British East India Company wasted no time and quickly set up a colony in Penang, an island on the western side of the Malacca Straits, present-day Malaysia. The British preferred setting up island colonies. It fit their worldview as an island nation, and they were much easier to defend. The British Navy would always be there to defend British interests, at least for now. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British lost interest in Southeast Asia. They had their hands full everywhere. Following Napoleon's defeat, British interests reignited. These interests were helped along by Sir Stamford Raffles. He was born at sea in 1783, and his father abandoned him and his mother at a very early age. Stamford, born Thomas, had to drop out of school to support his family. He was an extremely devoted son and a passionate human being. To state the opinion of John Curtis Perry, he was, quote, feverishly ambitious, highly purposeful, enthusiastic, and independent. Raffles displayed that criterion of leadership that is having the courage to challenge authority. Unquote. He began ignominiously as a clerk at the headquarters of the British East India Company. In 1805, he was placed in charge of the island colony in Penang. Not being of high society, Raffles was continually ostracized by his counterparts for his lack of decorum. This only increased the zeal with which Raffles went about his short life. The colony at Penang was out of the way, far off course for sailing vessels making the run through the Straits to China or India. They needed something closer to the main causeways. First, they captured Malacca from the Dutch in 1795. This conflict was part of the larger French Revolution. During the ceremony handing over power, a controversy arose. Britain claims that the acting Dutch governor granted independence to the Sultan of Johor and the surrounding islands. The Dutch claim nothing of the sort happened. What truly happened remains unclear. What we know is that the same Dutch governor had impressed upon his government the need to settle a Dutch colony on Singapore Island. This controversy would nearly lead to a war in 1819 when the impetuous Stamford Raffles first set down roots in Singapore. When Stamford arrived in Singapore, there were supposedly only 30 people inhabiting the whole island. Stamford Raffles was a highly educated and adroit man. He taught himself French and Malay 
It is said that upon arriving, he spoke better Malay than many of the so-called interpreters the British employed. This garnered him many local supporters. This was not another Briton who looked down his nose at the people he managed. Additionally, Raffles was a published historian, writing a comprehensive history of the island of Java in 1817, all while en route to be knighted. Throughout this work, there are not so subtle jabs at the colonial Dutch government. Raffles despised the Dutch and felt no qualms about speaking on his disdain. He and his wife spent weeks campaigning for the Singapore colony, and in 1819 they were finally granted the right to build a trading post on Singapore's main island. In true British fashion, they interpreted this as a grant of territorial sovereignty. There were protests and grumblings from the Dutch, but the Dutch Empire, once mighty and rich, was now weak. Their ability to threaten vast areas of the globe from their bases in Holland and Zealand had long disappeared. They considered military action against this new British presence, but decided against it. Instead, a so-called paper war was waged between the bureaucracies of the two countries. Raffles referred to the Dutch as, quote, preposterously wicked enemies, solely attentive to their own commercial interests, unquote. He goes on to say, quote, Their intercourse with these regions invariably adhered to a more cold-blooded, illiberal, and ungenerous policy than has ever been exhibited toward any country, unless we accept the conduct of European nations toward the slave coast of Africa, unquote. Raffles was truly a man ahead of most in his time. He believed in emancipation low taxes, and freedom of movement and religion. The paper war would continue unabated for years, until the Treaty of London in 1824 finally settled the matter. Britain granted the islands south of the Malacca Strait to the Dutch, while the Dutch gave up any right to Singapore and Malaysia. In a strange twist on their usual relationship, the island-oriented British now controlled the mainland while the continental Dutch controlled the vast island chains. When it first came into being, Singapore experienced severe trauma and culture shock. Commerce was seized by the locals. When Raffles complained to the local Temengang, the Malay said he and his ancestors had been pirates. There was no dishonor in taxing the sea lanes this way. For all his protesting, Raffles should have remembered his history. His homeland sea dogs had caused mayhem for commerce across the globe. Regardless, Singapore was open for business, and there would be complete freedom of trade, movement, and religion. The settlement's novelty and open doors attracted suitors the world over. Those traveling from Africa or India headed east invariably passed right by Singapore. The settlement grew as thousands of immigrant Chinese laborers arrived from the Fujian and Canton regions, and Tamil and Gujarati Indians arrived from the west. Europeans arrived from the south, risking the journey through the Cape of Good Hope, and from the north, Malays came in droves seeking work as manual laborers. The fact that this settlement enjoyed a history as the center of a vast global trade network helped immensely. The monsoon winds favored Singapore. The Chinese junks and Malayan prows sailed once more for Singapore. Newly added to the mix were the frigates and man-o'-wars from northern Europe. On his return trip to England, a fire broke out on Raffles' ship. John Curtis Perry says it destroyed, quote, 122 crates of books, objects, specimens, manuscripts representing years of work, unquote. This catastrophe was nothing compared to the last three years. His first wife and three of his four children had died, victims of tropical diseases for which the Europeans were not prepared. Raffles was also in poor health. He had blinding headaches which rendered him useless for hours on end. Had he lived in modern times, Raffles probably would have been diagnosed with a massive brain tumor. On July 5, 1826, Raffles was dead. His body was discovered on the bottom of a flight of stairs. He was 45 years old. Before his passing, Raffles left his mark 
He understood the colony was lacking in raw resources and food would need to be imported en masse. He also recognized that people would be his main asset. With this in mind, he meticulously laid out the original design for the settlement of Singapore. He understood that the Chinese inhabitants under British command could be an incredibly useful tool for money-making. These same Chinese inhabitants never forgot their connection to their homeland, and these contacts proved invaluable for up-and-coming traders who quickly found themselves as rich as their British counterparts. In time, these peoples would become the modern Peranakan culture, which is composed of people from South China and archipelagic Malay. The same went for the Indian inhabitants of Singapore, who plied their trade with stunning efficiency. The native Malays, unfortunately, found themselves on the outside looking in. Their culture had no tradition of commercial pursuits, and the stunningly fast-paced nature of modern port life likely gave many of them pause. They were used to a much slower-paced life. This different perspective led to racist stereotypes about Malay peoples, which are still prevalent in Singapore today. Arabic peoples were also present on the island, and in time, they came to control almost 50% of the land in Singapore until their decline in the 20th century. Singapore also boasted Javanese, Bengali, and Bugis workers and seamen. It was truly a melting pot with diversity and uniqueness everywhere, depending on where you were. As these people lived and worked alongside one another, secret societies and gangs began to develop along ethnic and cultural lines. In no time at all, Singapore became an incredibly unsafe place, especially for those who were part of a minority community. For the British, these minor nuisances mattered little when scaled against the buckets of money their merchants and shipping companies were making thanks to Singapore's unique position. Try as the authorities might, pirates continued to be an issue. Singapore became the main target for the profession. Many pirates would disguise themselves as passengers or crewmen, only to launch their attack on an unsuspecting captain. Indeed, things were moving along at breakneck speed. New technologies and advancements pushed the pace of day-to-day -day life closer and closer into the modern era. During Raffles' time, these changes were already beginning to take place in his native Britain. Following the trailblazer's death, the pace of industrialization and the spread of interconnectedness only increased. The advent of steam power changed everything for the ocean-goer, while the telegraph and telephone brought news, which once took a month or more to travel, at new lightning-quick speeds. But technological advancement always comes at a cost, and in this region, the price was high. One thing that remained constant throughout the region were addictive drugs. Opium was used by millions of Chinese inhabitants who spent their lives in dens and fell into deep, drug-fueled dreams. It was becoming an epidemic. But the British saw immense value in the trade. They sold opium to the Chinese in large amounts through private traders. The emperor responded by banning the trade throughout his domain. This quote-unquote intolerable act led to the First Opium War and eventually the Second. Britain blockaded Chinese ports and repeatedly decimated the Chinese armed forces. In the most famous instance, they completely destroyed the Summer Palace. In China, this is part of the century of humiliation. During this period, John Curtis Perry says Singapore was, quote, an early version of a narco state. Even into the 1930s, the government was drawing nearly one-third of its revenue from opium, unquote. These two wars reaffirmed the British right to free trade with China. It also garnered Britain the Chinese islet of Hong Kong. One of the major events during this war was the sailing of the British-designed Nemesis. This ship was strange in that it was made entirely of iron, gaining the distinction as the world's first ironclad. It ran using steam-powered paddles, but it also had a sail for emergency use. 
The Nemesis was officially classified as an armed merchant ship, and the fact that it could operate in shallow waters made it invaluable for patrolling the Yangtze, as well as the other major rivers in China. Steam had just arrived, and it changed the world, but its effects on Singapore were drastic. With the British acquisition of Hong Kong, Singapore found itself playing second fiddle to this Chinese port. It proved to be a more direct route for Chinese goods, but this loss was actually not as crucial as many dreaded it would be. Today, the two port cities maintain a fierce rivalry. Singapore proved to be as powerful an economic competitor as ever. The settlement was now the largest port east of Colombo, Sri Lanka. To combat the forever increasing wait times, the decision was officially made to begin construction of a massive harbor away from the original location on the Singapore River. Dubbed Keppel Harbor, it would prove to be a boon for a colony which was already enjoying economic success. Steam was rapidly changing everything. The sounds and the smells people experienced on the sea and the coasts were rewritten. Monsoon winds were no longer needed to push your prow through the straits. Now, coal powered your vessel, and dry docking was a necessity. The few Europeans were invariably the captains and first mates of these vessels. The Malay and Chinese people were forced to do hard labor, usually stoking the never-ending fire with coal in horrible conditions. This downside for the laborer was a boon for Singapore, as the island took on a new and immeasurable importance as a coaling station, while still maintaining its power as an entrepot and shipping hub. The 1860s were a momentous time for Singapore. Several developments quickly made Singapore invaluable to the world's merchant navies. These developments began with the British East India Company's dissolution. The company had suffered from corruption and mismanagement for years. The final nail in the coffin was the Sepoy Rebellion of 1857, in which British power nearly came to an end in India. In the carnage that followed, over 800,000 Indians would be dead from disease, starvation, and atrocities. As the trade company folded, Singapore was granted the status of Crown Colony in 1867. In the years previous, Singapore was administered by British Calcutta. Now it would be run from London directly. In 1869, French private interests opened the Suez Canal. This cut shipping times dramatically for those journeying east. The earth was getting smaller every year. Finally, in 1871, the British connected Singapore directly to London via underwater telegraph cables. These two achievements were astounding marvels of modern technology. Previously, travel to Europe from India, Southeast Asia, and the Far East was incredibly expensive, dangerous, and time-consuming. It was impractical to move goods across land, and railroads were not equipped to carry mass cargo. One of the originators of the idea to open the Suez Canal was philosopher Claude Henry Saint-Simon. He believed that, while also being an obvious economic boon for the countries which had them, canals could create a utopian society in which the barriers that once separated peoples and nations could be overcome. Other ideas were thrown around. The British wanted to turn Venice into a massive hub for eastern goods, but the money and labor needed to move cargo over land had proved to be enormous. The canal tanked global prices, while nearly doubling the income of Singapore's powerful merchant class. Manufactured goods from across Europe flooded every corner of the East, while in Europe, a new Eastern aesthetic enraptured the well-off. Chinese porcelain re-emerged as a luxury item. By 1914, as World War I began, the Panama Canal changed the world even further. Now both halves of the globe were artificially split, simply for human convenience. In both circumstances, the nations who profited the least from their canals were the nations in which the canals were located. The people of Egypt and Panama saw little return for the severing of their land until very, very recently.
The electric telegraph was a piece of technology which had long been in development. Original versions of it date back to France in the early 1700s. But the telegraph as we understand it was only patented in 1838. This patent was granted to the British inventor Edward Davy, who demonstrated the telegraph's efficacy in Regent's Park. The British government quickly took up the telegraph as a means of administering their far-off colonies and armies. The process of laying cable was long and expensive, and occasionally local fishermen found their boats tangled up in the wires. On the whole, however, the practicality of the telegraph overwhelmed any amount of money it cost to install. Anywhere in the world was now only minutes away. Shipping companies were soon in on the fad. Now a captain was directly beholden to their boss the second they arrived in port. Previously, a captain had almost complete control of the cargo and his crew. Now this control extended only to the open ocean. Singapore, for all its advantages, were missing a dry dock. Without one, a steamer would need to waste time and money taking their business elsewhere. 16,000 ships visited the small island port, and traffic was commonplace. The Tanjong Pagar Dock Company took the lead on modernizing the coastline. Steam ran everything until the 1880s when electricity became the norm throughout a good portion of Singapore's businesses. In spite of modernization, the port was still woefully under-equipped for the mass amounts of shipping, which were constantly passing through Singapore. As the 20th century began, the Tanjong Pagar Dock Company was taken over by the colonial government so that they could better administer the vital shipping lanes. Singapore lacked a naval shipyard, and mechanization was still slow to take root. The Boxer Rebellion in China only increased the need for a shipyard, as the rise of Japanese power in East Asia gave the British Navy pause. In spite of these far-off problems, the money still flowed like water, the rich became richer, while the poor wasted away at their behest. Singapore has long been an exporter of Malayan tin. The island's access to the vast hinterland with its many resources was truly a powerful thing. The revolution of the tin industry made Singapore the largest smelter of tin, as well as the largest exporter. However, tin was soon supplanted by rubber. Rubber is a true miracle substance. The process of making rubber begins with tapping local trees, which allows the extraction of the natural latex. Then, depending on which type of rubber is being manufactured, the latex will go through several processes to either be liquefied or coagulated. By 1914, nearly one half of the world's rubber was being manufactured in Malaysia. It was used for everything from car tires to shoe soles. The growth of Malaysia's rubber industry was thanks to Henry Nicholas Ridley, nicknamed Mad Rubber Ridley. He plied the interior of Malaysia and tried to convince farmers to grow rubber instead of coffee and other cash crops. His interest in it and his vocal support came from years of studying the trees. He saw the revolutionary potential in the substance. Modernization would not stop. Japan had recently begun operating a shipping company out of Singapore while the German presence became such that there was a pro-German cultural club in Singapore called the Teutonia. The French had supplanted the British in having the largest shipping company. In spite of this, France participated little in maritime traffic. Meanwhile, the British were making strides in the realm of economics, with the founding of Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, or as we know it, HSBC. At the same time, rival shipping companies were arguing that, quote, competition is an expensive luxury, unquote. They decided to sit together at the first conference of its kind to agree on rates and prices for their industry. Underneath this sprawling commercial world, there was a deeply dark scene playing out. Men, usually from China, were kidnapped from their villages and sent to far-off colonies to work the jobs no one wanted. These snatchers were called the crimps because of the small spaces into which they shoved their victims. Their victims were called human pigs 
and in time, the pens they were held in became known as pig pens. These men, and occasionally women, became known in Singapore as coolies. Thought to be an Indian word originally, it came to mean bitter strength in Chinese, and the term coolie was soon applied to any menial Chinese laborer. One Canton survivor says of the conditions, quote, Before sending the men, all are mustered in the large room or compound, and the keeper cries out that those who were willing to go are to take one side, and those not willing the other. Then the unwilling ones are flogged into acquiescence. I was so flogged myself. Some in despair committed suicide with opium, and others hung themselves." Unquote. In another account, the governor of Hong Kong recounted, quote, Hundreds of them gathered together in barracoons, or slave pens, stripped naked and stamped or painted with the letter C for Cuba, P for Peru, or S for the Sandwich Islands, a.k.a. Hawaii, unquote. The people who were sent to Singapore were treated marginally better than those sent to the Caribbean, as they could at least speak their native language there. In Cuba, Peru, or Hawaii, they were treated as cattle, and many thousands died. The contribution of these workers is rarely brought up, but whether it was shoveling precious guano in Peru or mining tin in Malaysia, they lived and often died in wretched conditions. A person's status was almost entirely dependent upon their ethnicity. The British ultra-minority ran the show. The Chinese middleman pushed his goods. The Indian merchant acquired the rights to move the items. The Arab banker provided the capital, while the Malay kept the British home tidy and the Javan reared the British children. There were stunningly few women in Singapore. Brothels were in high demand, and venereal disease was a huge problem for visiting Britons and manual laborers alike. 300,000 people bristled about at the port and in the town where dozens of languages sounded and the smell of Chinese tobacco swept the streets. The city still had no sewage system, so human feces, or endearingly referred to as night soil, was common. Mechanization was still behind, and the rickshaw was the main mode of transportation for goods and humans alike. As World War I began, the downfall of the British Empire was within sight. In Singapore, German U-boats destroyed a French and Russian warship, but there was never any planned attack on the island or British Malay. As millions were butchered on the fields of Flanders and the frozen fields of Poland, the British were shown how truly vulnerable their eastern empire was. The 5th Indian Light Infantry were one of the only garrisoned units in Singapore. Their forces were mostly Muslim, and the recent entrance of the Ottoman Empire into the war shook the loyalty of many millions of Muslims living within the British Empire. The Ottoman Sultan declared a holy war against the Allies and asked for all devout Muslims to join his armies. In Singapore, a local Muslim business owner, and Iman, began feeding the soldiers misleading information. They told the Muslim soldiers they would be deployed to fight against fellow Muslims in the Middle East. In reality, the soldiers were to be sent to garrison Hong Kong. Regardless, the lie was accepted, and this further inflamed the unit. February 15, 1915 saw Chinese New Year's celebrations in full swing. Under the cover of the exploding firecrackers, the Muslim soldiers murdered their commanding British officers. Next, they freed dozens of German POWs and began a killing spree, the likes of which Singapore had not seen since Sultan Mahmud's debauched life came to an end with the help of an Orang Kai spear. They held up British citizens driving in their cars and killed the occupants execution style. By the end... Forty innocent Europeans would be dead, victims of misinformation. Singapore quickly called on any help that was available. Four hundred locals were sworn in as constables. Among them were two hundred Japanese citizens, armed and led by their embassy. Soon another 180 Japanese sailors landed in Singapore. 
They were joined by French and Russian soldiers and sailors, and the rebellion was promptly put down. The mutineers were never organized. Once they faced resistance, some attempted to flee to the mainland, but there would be no connection to Greater Malay until 1923, when a causeway would finally be constructed. The retribution was swift. Forty of the sepoys were chosen for public executions. Tied to a stake, without a blindfold, they had to endure a laboriously drawn-out death. First, it was decided that the sentences and crimes would be read aloud in four separate languages. Then, when the time finally came for the firing squad to take their shots, many of its members were belligerently drunk, leaving several accused sepoys clinging to life following the indiscriminate volleys. As World War I ended, it was clear America and Japan had gained the most from the conflict. Both came out virtually unscathed, while Germany, Russia, France, Italy, and Great Britain were traumatized and decimated, while Austria and the Ottoman Empire were completely split apart. In the years to come, Japan's power would rise to stunning new heights. The young men of Tokyo would show a fighting spirit which was long renowned in Asia, but little witnessed by Europeans. Singapore would prove to be one of their greatest conquests. The Japanese used technology, a martial spirit, and an impetuousness rarely seen in warfare to dismantle the 400-year-long hold Europeans had over Southeast Asia. The path of destruction they paved on their way to power would leave millions dead, and just as many questioning the ability of any colonizer to keep them safe. In the next episode, we'll discuss how this occupation of Singapore affected its inhabitants, how the Japanese were eventually defeated, and how the modern states of Southeast Asia came into being. Thank you all for listening to this episode of Turning Tides. I'm your host, Joseph Pascone. Thanks again, everyone. Um, this is the sixth month anniversary of Turning Tithes. I wanted to do this episode especially because when the show first started, uh, there was an astounding number of listeners from Singapore. And through that, I became deeply fascinated by the island. I've come to love the island. It, it reminds me so much of Puerto Rico and, and the Orangelaut remind me so much of the Tainos. And I'm just really appreciative for everyone in Singapore who's listening to this. Um, if you enjoyed this, please let me know. E email the show. Um, like us on Facebook, etc. And, and this is the six month anniversary. So thank you all so much. I really, really appreciate it. If you like what you heard today, you can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast, as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices, and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. -O -O. Thank you again.